about Jersey? You've got a very special oh, liking the, for Jersey. <coughs> well, that was the year, unfortunately, that Mr. Presley died. Yes. 1977. I'll never forget driving to the uh, the place we worked in St. Elia. It was Bean's West Park Pavilion, and we were packing it. Absolutely wall to wall, weren't we? No, oh, yeah. Every night it was evening, you couldn't get in. And that night I'm listening to Radio Luxembourg and Elvis has died. Well, Albert was an Elvis fan, avid. He worshipped him. Absolutely. Until he came into the dressing room, everything seemed to be all right. <laughs> Until he came in and said, here, Alec, we're going to bring Elvis on tonight in a coffin. <laughs> well, that was it. Albert flew at him like a tiger. <laughs> and, uh, oh, they were, they were hell on. And, uh, <laughs> wasn't it? Oh, yeah, funny. Oh, but, but that, and the, the champagne, he used to give us champagne. Do you remember that? You had been a cracking fella. <laughs> we used, he brought us a crab every night because the lads down there oh, were yeah. uh, fishermen and we really liked crab. It was always a live crab. Well, no, it wasn't a live crab. It was it, it was all cooked. But big, they were huge, these things. The claws were like my hands. They were yeah. just amazing things. <laughs> and it was enough for all of us, you know. And he brought his crab one night and he gave me the knot and he said, it's alive, is that one? But he still wrapped it all up in newspaper and everything. It was all wrapped in newspaper and the claws were out. Yeah. So I said, it's like, he said, it's alive. I said, right, right. I said, Albert, I think crab tonight, the size of that. That's a big bugger, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he took his hand off. <laughs> of course, he went and floated me again for that one, bless him. Uh, <laughs> so, all the time, you would always pick on poor old... No, 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 no. no, 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 it's, no. it's just that those are the funny times yeah. you remember, and, and Albert was... I did a few on him as well. Oh, I mean, I've had my Mickey Tech now, I mean, something awful, but... Yeah, Graham used to, but, likes to drink, Graham likes to drink, and we used to have a big Cadillac. Oh. Big long black colour kind of stretch. Well, it wasn't stretched. It was a long limo, and the windows were blacked out. And we had a lot of fun with that uh, because the windows were blacked out. People would overtake us and look in and see who was in. They couldn't see. Oh, it must be somebody. Was it royalty? Who was it? We brought one of the first Cadillacs into the country. So and then they would slow down, let us overtake them, and then overtake again and slow down. It really annoyed us. So what we did was we got hold of. Um, I made it actually. I got hold of a piece of exhaust pipe from a Scrambles motorbike which is like a piece of tube and it's got an outer covering with holes in it and I sprayed it matte black and it just looked like the barrel of a how it's a gun. It just looked like a barrel of a gun. So when this car overtook us, the next one overtook us on the motorway, one of these black windows came down and this thing came out. Out of the blackness, this barrel. And this car just went on its brakes, straight into the grass verge, down and in back and oh! And they slung this thing because the police, the police, police pulled us up and said, Have you got a gun? No, oh, no. <laughs> but he used, to, he used to like a drink, did Graham? So we'd be coming on from a booking and be absolutely legless and he'd be sat in the back snoring away. <sighs> so we'd get to about Oldham. I think, Oh, it's about time to drop him off now. So I'd pull up outside a house in Oldham. <laughs> he lives in Leeds. <laughs> so we've got wrong town, wrong street, wrong house so far. And we said, Graham, you're home. Right, hey, eh? right. And he'd get, out, get his suit out of the back and he'd be wandering up this drive. Something wrong with this bloody lock. <laughs> and he's trying to get into somebody else's house. And they're all sat in the car laughing. <laughs> and then Morris with it with Morris with the limo. The limo broke down. Oh. And the ache and they couldn't fix it, so they had to get this special long truck thing to put it on because it was 26 foot long. So they put it on the back of this truck. Morris is still asleep. It broke down, he didn't know about it. We call the AA, waiting three quarters of an hour, he's still asleep. We're in we're in the front of this van. The car is now on the back, there's a flashing light, and when you're going down the motorway at 70 mile an hour with the car on the back of the truck, Morris is still in the car asleep. And then he wakes up and has a heart attack. <laughs> He's doing 70 mile an hour, there's no driver and there's nobody in the car. <laughs> and he's 12 foot off the ground. <laughs> the best one with Morris, I've got to tell her where this would be. The best one with Morris, we had a roll of sterling, which was brilliant. Oh, it did everything, didn't it? This, this was the one on the Butlins tour, because it, it was a car that we hired, and it had electric everything. I mean, the first time we'd had all these electric seats and windows, and it just had everything, this car. And uh, Morris had really long, bushy hair then with the beard. And he's quite tall, he was six foot two. And he always just sit in the front because he's got long legs, so we'd let him have the front seat so he could stretch a bit. So Wasty, and he would, he would snore and sleep for England. He'd have half a dozen ciders and that'd be him, wouldn't he? Mm. So when he's asleep, we'd, we'd be down on the buttons. First of all, we'd turn the seat heater on. 
which takes about five minutes to warm up and then you get so unbearably hot, especially if you're not expecting it, you've been asleep. All of a sudden your seat's red hot. So the heat seat heater is now on. And we move the seat forward. And his knees are coming up. Like this. <laughs> then we send the seat up. So his knees are trapped under the dash and his head's up by the sunroof. And then we bring the back forward. So he's now like this, <laughs> asleep, with the seat heater on, and he's up and as far as he can go. We then open the sunroof, about that much, and close it, and his hair is now trapped in the sunroof. <laughs> There's only one thing will wake Morris up yep. when, he's, when you're driving. Just dab the brakes. Touch on the brake. Oh, what's that? What's that? Hey, 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 what are we? Hey, hey, hey. Oh. And you have to sleep again. But you just, all he had to do was just dab the brake. Anything else wouldn't wake him up. Yeah. So he's got his hair trapped in there, the seat is on, he's trapped again, think, dab the brake. That was it. <laughs> his ass is on fire and he can't move. We were in hysterics. Oh. The funniest sight you've ever seen. Put your energy levels up, that's what he said, isn't it? Right, here we go. <laughs> ah. Ah. You know, we do work hard as English, you know. Everybody else seems to have more holidays than us. We should chill out, shouldn't we, now and again? Yeah. I'm doing it, pal. Chilling out. Yeah. Um. <laughs> You've obviously had a a fantastic time. We've had a great life. It's been a wonderful, it's a nice way to earn a living making other people happy. Yeah. So yeah. getting, it's instant job satisfaction as well. The time we went to the, we went to the Isle of Man quite regularly. We did 76, 78, 79 and 80 in the Isle of Man. And uh, we got on the plane once to go across and uh, Robin and I both old uh, private pilot's licenses and the chap that taught us just happened to have left and got a job flying for Manx Airlines. So we got on the plane and he puts his head round the door and goes, Now then lads. And it's our old instructor, Mr. Pullen. Yeah. Dave Pullen. Yeah, Dave Pullen. He said, do you want to have a go? He said, yeah, if you, yeah, okay. And all these people are going, um, <laughs> Long hair we had and in hippie clothes. Yeah, I had a tin of beer in my hand. <laughs> I'm in a fly then, I went, and all these people are going, oh, I do. <laughs> Fast in the seat, we and everything. And uh, halfway across the Irish Sea, uh, I came out and I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go to the toilet. I need to go to the loo. And I had a piece of string and there's a little old lady sat in the front. I said, will you keep this piece of string tight like? <laughs> yeah. Yes, she said. And she's there, this little old lady. <laughs> All of a piece of string going to the front of the aircraft. <laughs> Of course, Dave Pullen's letting it out, and she's going, oh, look at it. Wonderful times, wonderful times. Did you tell her the truth at the end of it? We told her that, we told, we bought, we told her to come to see the Grumbleweeds at the, at the Lido, and we, get, we get, bought some flowers and everything, and she was most impressed that she'd been the, uh, uh, the butt of one of our jokes. She thought yeah. it was lovely. But the, the Isle of Man, uh, what about that girl that we, we turned up there and she said, uh, Oh, you're the Grumbleweeds, I'm your spotlight operator and I shall be expecting a rather nice after the season present. Yes. I always get one. I got one from the Dallas boys and I got one from somebody else. So I shall expect a nice pleasant because I shall be your spotlight operator. <laughs> All right, lovely. Well, yes, there we go. We've got a live one here. <laughs> We go. <laughs> so we said, right, in this particular part of the act, we were doing a rehearsal, we said, now this is where we want the spotlight to go down to a pin spot, so a very, very narrow spot, because the pigeons will be coming out of this case and they'll be flying. Now they need the spotlight to fly up. They will fly up the spotlight, otherwise they just walk flying to the walls, they don't know where they're going. They're trained to fly up the spotlight. Yep. Right, right, right. Carry on. Um, so there's a knock on the dressing room door. Next night, have the pigeons arrived? <laughs> no, love, uh, there's a bit of trouble with the RSPCA. Um, 
import and export of poultry. Uh, there won't be uh, until, well, we're hoping that any day now. Right, thank you. Shut the door. Next night. Have the pigeons arrived? <laughs> we used to give these excuses. Excuse after Every excuse. Every night, and it, excuse. So, tell them about when, when, when she said she realised that these birds were going to land on her and the spotlight. Yeah, she was concerned. She said the spotlight's very, very hot. It's, it's going to burn their feet. Of course, there wasn't any spotlights. The whole thing was a sham. So we said, oh, so Graham says, that, well, you would make them little asbestos feet, uh, <laughs> shoes, little asbestos shoes. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes, good, good, fine. And they never materialised. And we did oh, 12 weeks there. Yeah. Every night we wound her up. And then on the last night, she says, now, this present you wanted, lovely. Yes, my present. I said, right. Well, you know that lovely gift shop that's uh, halfway down so-and-so hill coming into Douglas? Oh, yes. I said, well, just go in and choose yourself a nice present. Don't go mad. Just anything up to 50 quid. Oh, thank you. Very nice. So uh, I said, and tell them to wrap it for you and get a little card and you put on uh, so you can show your friends with love from the Grumbleweeds. Yes. And tell them to wrap it up and then just leave. Just walk out of the shop and say, the Grumbleweed will pay for this. <laughs> so she did. We were on the ferry. Yeah. <laughs> we were a bit naughty. Uh, so they, tell me about, the, in the few moments we've got left, uh, a serious question, and then I want to ask you about Rene and Renata. Oh, why? Um, they, what's the, what's the ice cream you, you were telling well, me? Well, that telling was another thing in Scarborough. We, we do as much as we can for charity, and there was a charity cricket match at Scarborough Cricket Ground, which is a lovely place. <laughs> and uh, Rennie and Renata were on the, 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 the theatre down the road, and um, we said, can we, can we sort of bring him in properly? And this groundsman said, how do you mean? I said, well, there will be a small vehicle. Oh, he said, it'll be all right, as long as he doesn't get onto the pitch, onto the wicket. Of course, he comes on in an ice cream van. Do you remember Rini and Renata? Yeah. He's singing, Save your man. He's singing, he, just one cornetto, that's what he was singing. <laughs> just the one cornetto. Yeah, and this, this groundsman is tearing his hair out. Because there's an ice cream van driving up and down the cricket pitch. <laughs> and there's a county match the next day. Of course, uh, he gets out of the van and... Uh, and uh, Gives everybody an ice cream and everything, and the poor ice cream, we, we, we'd collared this chap and he, he was about 50 quid light. Because everybody thought that the ice cream was free, you see. Uh, so we, we'd not only just bankrupted an ice cream man, but we lost the fellow at groundsman's job. And uh, I think the wicket was like, not in Yorkshire's favour that day. Well, I could hear him saying, well, this, this ball's all over the place this morning. I don't know what's happened to wicket. We knew, didn't we? <laughs> you did it. If we're talking about comedy, and I always ask this question of people because I'm just intrigued to know what your view would be. But Robin, who's your favourite comedian? I've got uh, lots and lots. I like, I love Billy Connolly. I love his outlook on life. I went to see Lee Evans the other night and just laughed for two hours because he's, I like the way he delivers. He's, he's, it, it is a kind of comedy that I unfortunately can't do uh, because of the way we work. Um, it is observation comedy. There is a lot of alternative comedians that aren't funny, I don't think. They say stuff and you think, well, yeah, and, you know, everybody's going, woo, 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 but it doesn't actually make you laugh. Uh, Billy Connolly does make me laugh, and he, I think he makes everybody laugh because of the way he delivers and the, he's, he's, he has aspect for it. I can write for Billy Connolly, but I can't write for me. You know, I could write ideas. If I was, if I was doing, somebody says, oh, if you do half an hour of Billy Connolly, I could probably put together half a dozen ideas and say, right, this is how Billy Connolly would do this. It's not something that we could do. For instance, um, the teapot. The teapot. Well, there's a, yeah, the teapot. He wrote a routine about teapot. Was okay, the te teapot routine. Never done this on stage. Never done it on the stage. So, um, Billy Connolly doing this. Hello! If you've ever been anywhere in the world and had a cup of tea or coffee, You'll undoubtedly have been served it in a little wee stainless steel teapotty thing that leaks. <laughs> they all leak, no matter where you are in the world. The thing is, how did they manage to sell these things to the entire catering nation? Who sold these things? Imagine the sales meeting. 
All the catering world are sitting there. And a wee guy from Glasgow comes up. Hello! I've got this little wee teapot thing that you might like to see. Can you tell us a bit about it? Aye, well it's leaks. <laughs> it's designed to leak. It's physically impossible to pour it without it leaking. <laughs> We've made the lid that wee bit floppy. It's three millimetres bigger than the hole. It doesn't seal. It will leak through the sides, through the town. Aye. You could sell lots of tissues as well to mop up all the mess. What's it made out of? Stainless steel. It burns you. That's red. That sounds just what we're looking for. We'll take 38 million of those if you please. <laughs> That's not really common to do that. Isn't it? You know what you need? What? Therapy, that's what you need. Oh, what really? Yes. What you need is a good hypnotist. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Well, tonight, I could do it. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> you see that? Yeah. When that moves, you're going to relax. Where are you going to put it? I'm going to sh show you. <laughs> Robin? Yeah? Can you hear my voice? Of course I can. I'm stood next to you. Are you nodding? Yes, I am. Are you shaking? Yes, I am. Are you feeling dizzy? That's brilliant. What is it? It's a remote control for a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's I, I tell you, I, not without wanting to give the story away, and I love this tale. It's the one when they've been very noisy and you decided that you were going to spoil it for them when they wanted you to be quiet. Oh, the, the bingo. bingo. Well, finish, finish with that, and I love that story. Well, Robin has always been the, um, the guy in the band who always got the first of everything. If something comes out, he had it. He wants this and that. And one day, I saw some psychedelic underpants. <laughs> and they were really sort of very bright colours, and it was the first that anybody had ever seen, because up to then it was wide fronts, and that was it. Um, so I bought a pair of these psychedelic underpants, and we were in the dressing room of this working men's club. And they'd been a bit rowdy, and they were playing bingo. So he said, Graham, here, put these beads around your neck. He says, and do the hula hula dance, right? Remember the grass skirt out of one of those curtains, those dark curtains that you walk through, and it's still all going on your face ten minutes later. <laughs> we made him a skirt out of that. So Carl sneaked his hand round, got his guitar, turned it on, and got a bottle, and, and said, Ready? I said, Yeah. And, and, and I went across the stage like this. And, and, uh, one or two people actually laughed. <laughs> and they, they weren't checking the bingo numbers at all. They were having two minutes silence for a chap that had died. <laughs> So he didn't bother checking it outside at all. He put a blank in it, a big 38 blank, and it was a big, big bang this gun. And he thought, I know what I'll do, I'll silence the sound from sound the rest of the show, which is going on, there's somebody on stage going, boys with the and keys. And he thought, I'll test this gun. And I'll test it in a, a sink full of water. So he put the barrel into the water, thinking that would deaden the sound. <laughs> What he didn't realise was the pressure that comes out of this is unbelievable. And it blew this sink to bits. <laughs> it, 
he had bits of sink stuck in his leg, there was water everywhere, and the noise was deafening. And he just walked, and everybody stopped, the show stopped, and he just said, works. <laughs> And then the bomb tank. Oh, we were we were setting up at Blackpool Opera House. And we have a bomb tank with full of an explosive and, and this lad, Kevin, we're two road managers then, Scottish lad called Kevin, had an explosives license for standard fireworks at Huddersfield. Yeah. He used to get the black powder and he used to the more black tape you wrap round it, the bigger the bang. So he's wrapping tape round this thing and they're testing it to see how how loud it's gonna be. And they put it in this bomb tank and it's on the front of the stage at the opera house in Blackpool and he sat on it, big ball, <laughs> talking to somebody. He just walked on the stage, they and he, everybody cleared, he cleared everybody, the stage. Everybody cleared the stage for an explosion. Except for Paul. So he sat down <laughs> sat on it. and he's talking to this bloke in the band pit who'd come in with him. And he said, put that there and it went off. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> Well, they found one of his testicles. <laughs> <laughs> what about Emo Phillips? Uh, now he's a weird guy. Oh, the American comedian. Yeah, well, Emo, is, is, that's an impression I learned a long time ago, because when I first saw him, I thought, oh, I'm going to do him. And I got it off, and all the audience just sat and stared at me. Like, you're going to do any minute. Because <laughs> nobody knows who he is, but he's a terrific character. He's got, his trousers are always too short, and he wears, his hair's all just sticking out, and... He's got a big, big nose like, hello, my name's Emo. I went to the doctors the other day. I said, I've got the biggest hemorrhoid in the world. He said, is that why you're sitting on a beanbag? I said, look again. <laughs> an idiot. <laughs> you seem to have voted everybody off. You should play the head-to-head -head on your own. <laughs> Start the clock and play. Wiggison! <laughs> Brian, what is ex-President Clinton's favourite musical instrument? Harmonica. <laughs> There is, a, there is a club, a club of people who don't remember things. You know, it's great. I mean, these people who don't remember stuff, they've only got to buy one video, haven't they? You can watch it every day. Fantastic. So we're doing this show, and we did a, I can't remember which job it was, but we did a job, and it absolutely brought the place down. And a couple of minutes later, I, I made a mistake, and started the same joke again. And he's looking at me and saying, you've done it, you've done it. So I thought, oh, and we finished the joke, and it went down just as well as it did the first time. We told the same joke 23 times. Just to see how many times we could do it. 23 times, and it got off every single time. And we came off this bloke and said, hey, you're bloody funny, you, I, you comedians, how do you remember all them jokes? <laughs> Got what you need, what you saw, oh what a perfect day. Good night.